Great, <clears throat> great, honey. And we ended that session exactly on time. So it's just a, re- a remarkable thing. Thanks to Christine and Connie for, for doing that. Uh, it's a model that we'll try to follow the rest of the day. Um, the next speaker is, uh, is a, a close colleague and friend of mine, uh, Victor Valcor. Victor is uh, also here at the University of California, San Francisco, where he's a professor both in the Department of Medicine and, and the geriatrics group. Uh, and in neurology, where he's got a very active clinical and clinical research program uh, looking at uh, various markers of memory and aging um, and has had a career-long interest in in HIV as it it affects, uh, uh, again, uh, memory, aging, uh, and cognition. Uh, uh, He is going to uh, take us through some of his work on uh, HIV and the aging brain uh, and cognition. Uh, and we look forward to, uh, to this very important uh, topic for all of our patients. So, uh, Victor, uh, welcome to the program. Great. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me to speak. It's uh, rather timely to follow a talk on frailty. Um, one of the, the things that I often say is that one of the leading reasons why people are uh, put into place in nursing homes or have to leave their home has to do with cognition um, and uh it's not part of the frailty analysis, but so it's a good to have some thoughts about it uh, when you're thinking also about frailty and, and what you would do in terms of following that. I don't have any financial relationships to disclose. <laughs> I hope after this talk, you'll be able to describe a bit of the clinical presentation of cognitive impairment in people living with HIV who have suppressed viremia, um, articulate the leading reasons for cognitive impairment in older people living with HIV, and <clears throat> list the divergent recommendations for cognitive impairment screening setting uh, in the setting of HIV. So here are the key points that I want to share. Cognitive impairment remains common, even among people who have suppressed uh, plasma viremia. I would guess that if you have 100 patients in your panel, uh, 20 to 30 of them have cognitive impairment, and many of them will be asymptomatic, <clears throat> yet they still would have functional challenges that they're not disclosing. Causes of cognitive impairment sometimes multifactorial includes a role of chronic inflammation from our data and also comorbidities such as cerebrovascular disease. Uh, the co-occurrence of age-related neurodegenerations makes it really challenging for populations over 60. Um, and how you differentiate Alzheimer's disease, for example, from hand HIV-associated neurocognitive impairment is, is not easy. Uh, even uh, in my work, I'm often uh, really humbled by how challenging it is to differentiate these two. Recommendations for cognitive screening across published guidelines are simply inconsistent. I think that's the best thing to say. So the frequency estimates for cognitive impairment, I told you 20 to 30 percent, and that would be my best guess. That One of the big challenges in our literature is that large epidemiologic studies include people who are not suppressed or are inadequately uh, treated. And that's a, a real challenge because in your clinic, you can probably uh, get all patients suppressed uh, on the regimens that exist currently. Uh, and so what we really want to know is what's the frequency among those people that are on suppressive therapy and are, are, are suppressed. Uh, one example I give frequently is the charter group, which is frequently uh, quoted as 50% of people. But if you look carefully at the data in that study, 50% of those people were not on uh, therapy or were not suppressed. So it, it's, it, makes, it makes it rather hard. And the estimates across other countries is quite broad. So what, do you, what is commonly reported cognitive symptoms? What are people telling me when I, I, I see them? They often say memory problems. The truth is it's usually an attention rather than a memory problem or an inefficiency in learning challenge rather than a memory problem per se. Um, uh, Multitasking is another challenge that they have, uh, uh, talking about uh, having difficulty doing more than one thing at the same time. Attentional issues are also uh, often noted. They talk about rereading information or not hearing their their partner correctly um, and uh, that they use lists and cues to help remind them. Slowed responses is something that I see. The kind of Symptoms somebody might say to me is they can't keep up with the banter and conversations anymore. They go to parties, they, they feel uncomfortable, they become more socially isolated because they're not as quick uh, with the responses, they're not as quick in picking up what is being said. Um, sometimes I've had uh, people tell me that it's difficult to learn new music or even in some cases difficulty to learn new dance steps. And you can imagine that requires a pretty rapid thinking through where your motor 
uh, systems are going to work. And, and, uh, and I often talk, talk to them about it, it being almost like the car engine has thick oil in it and it's a little slower to, to go. I often hear about fluctuation, which is not surprising given that we have connections to inflammatory um, etiology. So uh, like the flu, you may feel better and one day and not better and not so good the next day. Um, the, 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 the realm of symptoms really hits the cognitive, the behavioral, and the motor areas. Less motor areas, I think, now, and they're rather subtle. Mostly we hear about the concentration of mental slowing. Again, uh, people think of it as memory challenge, but in our data, it, it usually isn't a, a, an encoding or memory problem. Um, often people have uh, depression and apathy, and there are some data linking that to HIV itself. And then when I do see motor problems, often it's coordination. So doing complex uh, uh, multi-step uh, tasks with their hands, for example, sometimes a little motor slowing uh, with finger tapping are, are things I commonly see. So what does a cognitive profile look like when we do, um, you know, a one-hour cognitive battery on people? Well, we do see attentional deficits. What does this look like? When we ask somebody to learn 16 words over five trials, the first time they hear the words, they remember very few of them. So they weren't really paying attention to get those words in. And then as we ask the, the trials five times, they may get up to 10 or 11 out of the 16, which would fall generally in a normal range, but it's, it's clearly inefficient um, and often inefficient to what they would have been like before. So they can learn the information. It just takes more trials to get up there. And, and if we had gone to 10, they might have been able to get all of them. <clears throat> we see slowed information processing. So many time tasks are a little bit slower. We see more challenges on tests of higher cognitive thinking. These are the types of things that require an individual to hold something in their memory while they do something else and then pull it back later. Uh, we see often that multiple domains are involved. So uh, uh, these attention and slowing um, uh, effects can affect all the tests that you give. And so we can often see that going across multiple domains. Mo most of the time, mild deficits, mild to moderate. And we followed some people for, you know, as far out as uh, at this point, 15 years in my studies. And we can just see year after year, they fluctuate. Sometimes they do better. Sometimes they do worse. Um, we don't see decline. Uh, and, unless there's another process going on. It's unusual, I should say, to, to see that kind of decline. Often in our studies, we image people, and there are quite a few imaging abnormalities that we see in the setting of HIV. Uh, probably as many as half of the people that I image over the age of 60 have some changes in the brain that are likely related to HIV. The challenging thing is that it doesn't seem to matter in terms of whether you have a uh, cognitive impairment or not. I have seen some images that would just, you know, are remarkably abnormal in a person who is cognitively normal. And as well, you can often see uh, normal imaging in people who have a lot of cognitive symptoms. So the imaging is really not that helpful. What we do see is atrophy, usually global atrophy, often atrophy that seems more central in nature. So it's coming, the ventricles can look a little bit bigger. And we see white matter changes on uh, flare imaging that links to cerebrovascular disease, but probably is more in the setting of HIV. Lab tests are not that helpful. Um, the current CD4 count doesn't matter, but the nadir, the lowest it ever was, uh, is a risk factor. So less than 200 would be a risk factor. And vi viral load, uh, you know, these, these individuals should all be suppressed in plasma. If they come to see me in clinic, that's the first thing that I make sure of. And we still see a lot of hand. So the plasma viral load is not really helpful. And I would say the CSF viral load is, is not very helpful in the absence of cases of CNS escape which is rare, uh, something that all, all doctors should know about, but I don't have enough time today to go into too much of the details on that. Um, certainly, if you have somebody with a more rapid progression, uh, getting an assessment would be important. And on the neurologic exam, I've already pointed out, we can sometimes see some motor slowing and some, some errors. Um, we do see progressive atrophy in older people living with HIV. This is a study that we published several years ago. In people that are suppressed out three years, we could see that the rate of brain shrinkage is faster than healthy aging people of the same age. Several studies have not seen this, but they've been largely among younger populations. And in one study, they excluded anyone who had substantial cerebrovascular disease in the study 
Uh, we've since gone back to look at our data and found that cerebrovascular disease does correlate to some of the atrophy, but it doesn't explain all of the progressive atrophy that we see in older people. So this is important because it may increase risk for neurodegenerative disorders in a kind of brain reserve way. We don't quite know that answer yet. I've mentioned already that inflammation is important uh, in terms of cognitive impairment. And this first study is one of my favorite studies um, of uh, healthy people, uh, uh, cognitively normal, tested normal, have no symptoms, are on good antiretroviral therapy, viral load is, uh, is suppressed, CD4 sat count is good. So these are just healthy community dwelling individuals with no cognitive issues. And what they found is compared to controls, this, uh, this TPSO binding, which is microglial activation in the brain was elevated in people with HIV. So even in the setting of very healthy, cognitively normal individuals, we can see more microglial activation um, in the brain. So that's inflammation in the brain. And they went further and they regressed the amount of that binding on the performance of executive function. And even though it was normal, there was co-variation. So the higher your TPSO binding, the worse you did on tests of executive functioning. So it was really quite a, a, a nice study. There are many others that correlate, particularly monocyte-based um, peripheral blood markers, such as MCP1 or a soluble CD163 to cognitive performance. We did one study where we took uh, blood MCP1 and neopterin, both related to monocyte activation, and we were able to show that the higher the levels were in plasma, the more abnormalities you had on di uh, uh, diffusion tensor imaging, which is really the axons, uh, you know, the neurons talking to each other through axons and the integrity of that process. So we were able to link it to a brain imaging finding. And then we took those DTI abnormalities and of course they, they linked to cognitive performance. So the DTI abnormalities um, in research do link. And again, that's not something you would typically get in a clinical setting. And I mentioned as well cerebrovascular disease as a challenge. Cerebrovascular disease occurs in quite a few people who are older. I'm not sure we're going to see the same thing in younger populations or in populations that were infected in the past 20 years. But the average duration of HIV for the people that I see is in 30 years. I see only people over the age of 60. So many of them even knew that they were infected in the 1970s. So we see a lot of cerebrovascular disease. It may be a phenomenon of having no treatment for a long time or even some of the early therapies. Um, but certainly in your older population, this is something you're going to see. And what do you see? Well, you see uh, in the top image that uh, that very bright white stuff. This is cerebrovascular disease in a periventricular pattern, which is a classic pattern for cerebrovascular disease, small vessel ischemic disease. And in the lower two panels, we often see these discrete lesions that aren't necessarily peri periventricular. Uh, I just saw an image yesterday from a patient who doesn't have HIV who has that. It looks like a little bit of an unusual pattern. But in fact, if you, when I went back and looked at all the images I've seen in people not living with HIV, I see this pattern with cerebrovascular disease as well. So these white matter lesions correlate uh, a bit to executive functioning performance, but I also, as I mentioned before, see these sometimes in people who are perfectly cognitively normal. Um, so it doesn't seem to link necessarily uh, well to, to people having a uh, hand. Um, so with that quick overview, what are the treatment recommendations? Well, adherence to antiretroviral medication must be, you know, key. Um, everybody, uh, with cognitive impairment must have a suppressed plasma viral load before I even go any further. Referral to a specialist if you're worried about age-associated neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. Consideration for CSF escape, which is rare, but particularly more rapidly progressive presentations um, th than I would, uh, I would often do a lumbar puncture. And then minimize polypharmacy and address medications that may impact um, cognition. I also talked to my patients a bit about compensatory measures because it's largely an attentional deficit. Really using compensatory measures work. Um, many patients respond to lists, for example, or reminders or alerts. Often they've already done this and figured it out. Limiting multitasking, trying to focus on one thing at a time is often helpful as well. I, I talk to them about disclosing to friends when they're having challenges with banter, and I don't get a lot of luck. There's more stigma to having a dementia or cognitive impairment, it seems, and even HIV. So, uh, but that's something I do talk to the patients about. And then when I'm confident of the diagnosis, I reassure them that I've been doing this work now for 20, 25 years, 
And in the setting of treated HIV, what I often see is fluctuation in cognitive performance, not a trajectory that you see, for example, in Alzheimer's disease of, of um, a worsening performance. I also uh, give them the statistics that 20 to 30 percent of people like them are having these symptoms and they suddenly feel that they're not alone. Uh, so any kind of support groups, I think, would be helpful. I like to throw this slide up. This is from 2017, published in The Lancet. It's not an HIV paper, but it just states that we could present, prevent 35% of dementia in high-income countries if we address these midlife, largely midlife risk factors. Um, and uh, in, in low-income low countries, probably over half, particularly looking at less education in early life. So looking at these in, in, with your patients is another thing that is of, of some value. I'm going to switch now to talking about cognitive impairment, um, and I uh, have some fairly um, heavy slides here. I'm not going to speak to all of them, but I did quite a bit of literature review um, to get to this, and I thought it'd be worth sharing with you some of the quotes. So what's in the blue boxes I'm not going to talk about, but you can get the slides and you can see where I'm getting the references on this. So HIV organizations have different guidelines, and they vary greatly. The ISA US, IAS USA guidelines, I think, are perhaps the most practical and it says uh, a validated test once annually after the age of 60. It doesn't tell you what validated test, but it's, it's a rather, you know, practical when you look at all the, the recommendations that, that are out there. The European guidelines, um, ask you to, to, uh, screen with questions, you know, and the questions are here in the blue box. Are you having problems with memory and so forth? This is particularly problematic because about half of people with a cognitive syndrome are going to be asymptomatic. And they still have functional problems when we do objective tests of function. So you'll miss quite a few. Also, you're probably going to get a lot of people who, like me, would say, yeah, my memory's not as good as it used to be, and I'm using lists more. And, and so you're going to get a lot of false positives as well. So I think these are kind of a, a little bit problematic. When you look at groups that are largely composed of neurologists, neuropsychologists, I think the, the guidelines become a bit impractical. This one, I, I happen to know the Mind Exchange Working Group, and they did bring in a lot of community physicians, but the core group um, was not. And their, the recommendations are every six months in high-risk people, every 12 months, uh, they they publish a couple, uh, you know, tests that could be used. Some of them were very impractical in the setting. So I give you the reference on this one, but I don't think it's terribly practical. A number of people have done review articles on this topic. Well, the most recent one I found in 2016, um, this is rather sobering. It basically says it's a controversial topic, considerable variation guidelines reflecting uncertainties in the literature. And in general, screening for cognitive impairment is not recommended in HIV positive populations without symptomatology. Um, and uh, so these these guidelines, I think, are very similar to what I came up with when I was being asked this question over and over in the early over uh, 10 years ago. I decided to do a review article on it that was published in CID. And I, I couldn't come up with any firm recommendations except don't use the mini mental status exam. Don't use the HIV dementia scale. Uh, they, they simply don't work for HIV related cognitive impairment in the setting of people with suppressed plasma viremia. We now have more data that show that they don't work, but back then we had only my, uh, my, my own uh, experience. The Montreal cognitive assessment is appealing as it taps multiple domains, uh, uh, co uh covered by HIV. But, um, I can show you the small study we did with 67 people and you can see the area on the curve is just not great. At the optimal cut point of 25, we had only 72% sensitivity and 67% specificity, which is a, a little bit worrisome uh, for a screening test. You'll have a lot of false positives and a, and a lot of uh, false negatives in that setting. But it is perhaps of the tests that have been uh, used, one that is, is, is perhaps closest. I think digital technologies have promise. I'm not sure we're there yet. The one that has been used the most is the NeuroScreen. It's been used in the United States. It's also a, a very elegant study done in South Africa, which demonstrated that it could be done by non, um, by, by lay people or by, but not by do doctors, nurses, or neuropsychologists, but other trained individuals. It takes about 30 minutes to do. It really mimics the test that we use in the se setting of HIV. And, and I think it's, it, it definitely shows promise. 30 minutes seems a bit long. Uh, it'd be nice to get something shorter. Cog State has one uh, published study, at least maybe more, but the one that I found, it's, it's, uh, it's a proprietary test, so you have to pay for each use. 
And we're currently looking at a, a test we have at, at UCSF called the Brain Health Assessment. It has great performance characteristics for identifying Alzheimer's disease in the early stage, so mild cognitive impairment, um, and it's free, and it takes about 10 minutes to do. On the platform, you can also get an anxiety test done. You can get a depression test done. You can even now get a test for traumatic brain injury, and we're looking into things like PTSD and others to put on the same tablet so you can get a more comprehensive uh, mental and cognitive assessment. I haven't had uh, any, I have no data yet on how well it works for um, HIV. It's something that we're working on. The other thing I like about the brain health assessment is it'll give you a performance score immediately based on a regression-based approach to norming. So you don't have to have a lot of controls and it can take into consideration a number of factors that could include some social determinants of health, like economic, food insecurity, and so forth. So uh, some work that we're, we're, we're working on. So in people over 60, you can't just be looking for HIV-related cognitive impairment. We need to think a little bit about, you know, Alzheimer's disease and other age-related neurocognitive disorders in your population, people over 60. So you're not just screening for HIV-related impairment. You're actually screening, uh, and I would say maybe even sometimes more importantly, for some of these age-related neurodegenerative syndromes that have a very different course. And you, you, you really want to allow people to know very early uh, that they have, uh, that they have a, a course of disease where they may be losing their ability to make decisions and they may want to get their affairs in order. So it really has different implications. So even in uninfected populations, um, you can find a broad array of recommendations. If you go to what some people would say is the gold standard, the, the, the U.S. Uh, Prevention Service Task Force, they say there's in, in, insufficient evidence to balance the benefits and harms of screening for cognitive impairment. And remember, this is in HIV uninfected populations. But the USPSTF is perhaps the most um, conservative approach. And so keep that in mind. I tend to like to go to the American family physician. I think often I find the most practical advice there in terms of this. So I did for this talk. And this is what they had. In patients with suspected dementia, use the MINICOG, the general practitioner assessment of cognition or the ascertained dementia eight item informant questionnaire uh, for an evaluation. So they're looking at people who are suspecting to have. So I, I, in, in this, I'm, I'm guessing it's symptoms or people, family members are, are worried about it. it at that point, it, to me, it doesn't become a screening. It becomes more of an assessment. And, and so I'm not actually sure this is the best recommendation for them. Um, they do recommend, however, everybody over the age of 65. Uh, should get some kind of an assessment. And that's probably a very practical thing. I've looked at these and I, I've described them a little bit down below. The mini cog is really not that difficult to do a clock drawing, which can be hard to score and, and a three word recall. And the general practitioner's assessment of cognition, also not that difficult, has a, a combination of objective and uh, subjective reporting. And then the ascertained dementia aid, I, I would worry a little bit about because it's all around subjective reporting. So unless you have a good proxy informant, somebody who can give you that information, it, it's a little bit difficult. So this is what the United, the U.S., uh, I, I guess I got an extra P there, but the U.S. Prevention Service Task Force, these are how they consider screening tools and whether you should use them or not. Uh, they ask these questions, Does, and, I, and I've, I've tried to apply them here to HIV-related impairment. Does screening in primary care settings affect clinical outcomes? I don't think we know that. What is the prevalence of undiagnosed cognitive impairment? Well, that's moderate. So that, that one, I think, is a, is, is, is a yes. Does a reliable and valid screening tool exist to detect cognitive impairment? I showed you the best data I have, and, and the area under the curve is only 0.75. Do pharmacological or non-pharmacological interventions including caregiver interventions, improve outcomes? Probably. Um, what are the adverse effects of screening and cognitive impairment? Well, some, you know, telling somebody who's asymptomatic and seems to be doing well that they have a cognitive uh, uh, syndrome may increase anxiety substantially. What are the cost, cost effectiveness of screening? Well, that's not known. What are the side effects of any proposed treatment? I would argue small, even with Alzheimer's disease, the, the side effects are, are probably pretty small. Uh, the, the efficacy as well is probably pretty small for what we have. So you can think about these as you're trying to decide in your own clinical practice. As I was thinking about this myself, uh, these are some of the conclusions that I came up with. Um, first of all, don't confuse screening with a workup for cognitive impairment. If somebody's concerned, coming to you with symptoms or a 
partner, uh, a loved one, somebody who knows this person is noticing change, this is no longer screening. This is workup. And none of this applies to the workup. The workup is going to require probably a referral for neuropsychological testing, maybe a referral to uh, somebody like me if you're worried about um, CNS escape or you're worried about uh, an age-related neurocognitive disorder. These can be extremely difficult to, to differentiate. And so uh, a referral may be, may be in order. I think you can tell that there's a lot of controversy around screening in both HIV infected and uninfected populations. I don't think that gives you license to just ignore the topic. I think coming up with practical solutions that work within the realm of your group is probably worth doing. And uh, I gave you some of the practical uh, ideas that I saw in some of the guidelines as I reviewed them for this talk. I think it would be pretty hard to meet the U.S. Prevention Service Task Force without a lot more research. It's very uh, evidence-based on what the benefits are down the road um, and what is the cost effectiveness. And th we, we don't have sufficient research right now to, be, to inform that. Maybe the firmest advice I can give is if you're looking for HIV-related impairment, the MMSC is not good. It taps too much orientation and, uh, and, and some memory. It doesn't tap enough of the executive functioning, the multitasking, the more complex things, and it really doesn't get to the mode of slowing. So it's not that useful. It is useful for typical Alzheimer's disease. So in that context, it's not a, a, a bad test for that, and many people do use it. The HDS, which is the HIV Dementia Scale, and the international version of the HIV Dementia Scale just uh, have little utility right now in today's environment for most uh, patients can have uh, suppressed, cognitive, uh, suppressed uh, viral loads. Um, so I, I, would, I would not recommend using it. The MOCA is reasonable. Uh, as I've said before, one challenge with the MOCA is, is in the last few years, they now require certification, which requires, I think, $200 to $300 every two years. Uh, for the person performing the test. So although it has been, um, it ha has been useful, uh, there's a little bit of a cost now. The MOCA also has uh, a Mo MOCA basic, which is, can be used in low literacy populations. And it's been translated in some cases, it's been culturally adapted, but mostly translated into multiple languages. So you can, you can perform it in, uh, for example, Spanish. And as I said, digital tools show a lot of promise uh, in this setting. So I, uh, I'm afraid I ended a little early. I, I was afraid I was going to run over and I spoke maybe a little faster than I, I could. So uh, I, I will hand it over to, to Dr. Volberding to see if there are any questions in the chat room, but I'm happy to speak a little bit more about any topic that I didn't cover sufficiently for everyone. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks so much, Victor. It was a, a really a, a tour de force of, uh, of a very challenging uh, area. Um, and uh, there are a couple questions in the in the, in the Q and A. I remind the audience to uh, to go ahead and uh, and put your own questions in, uh, and and we will um, explore some of these in in more detail. Um, one question that uh, that an audience uh, member uh, asked is: You said that there's not much change year to year in hand, and yet uh, is the brain shrinkage not getting worse with time? You, you, could you yeah. That? yeah, that's that's great. It may be sobering for everybody to know that I, I imagine everybody in this audience brain is shrinking. Your brain starts to shrink in the, your 20s and uh, and it shrinks throughout life. When I look at images of people in their 80s, I have to think a little bit about whether that shrinkage is clinically relevant or not. Is it more typical of that age? So we do see quite a bit of shrinkage in healthy aging um, or I shouldn't say healthy aging. I should say more typical aging and without any clinical consequences. So the amount of shrinkage that we're seeing is faster than aging, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to link to, um, to clinical consequences. Uh, to say it another way, in a more scientific way, uh, you can, you can uh, recover from loss of brain tissue by uh, more networking of your neurons. We see this in people, for example, that have stroke and lose a lot of tissue, and then over time, they gain a lot of their function back. And that's probably recruitment of other parts of the brain to cover it. So our brain is relatively resilient and, uh, and uh, we don't necessarily see that this is going to link uh, to the changes that we see on cognitive testing. But I think it's linking more is this level of inflammation. And 
the inflammation is largely we can measure we we actually get better results when we measure peripheral inflammation in the blood than when we re- measure it in CSF. We get better connections to plasma measures of inflammation to brain changes than even the CSF. So the source is probably going to be, um, you know, I think it's probably viral reservoirs that are causing little uh, uh, upticks in inflammation. It could as well be other infections, but uh, that's a, um, a source of con- uh, further conversation. A great picture. Um, question that uh, that I've had is that, you know, our p- patient population is, is clearly aging. Um, we are, you know, in, in my clinic, I think that many of our patients are in their 70s um, and some in, in their 80s uh, at a time when obviously we're starting to see more uh, risk for uh, Alzheimer's and other, um, you know, aging de- de- dementias. Um, how, can you talk about um, what the course is like? Is the, is the, is the, I guess not, not so much the frequency, but is the, is the course of Alzheimer's uh, different in an HIV uh, infected person? Does, does HIV uh, uh, increase the progression rate of, of that disease? I, I can only answer that in anecdotes because um, I, I don't really know any data. There, were, there, was a pa- there was a paper published several years back claiming to be the first case of Alzheimer's disease in somebody living with HIV. And uh, I mean, I've been seeing people with Alzheimer's disease in the study of HIV for, you know, probably 20 years. Um, I can count maybe 20 cases that I've seen. I've been a little surprised at the pace on some of them. I can remember one individual who went from a, a, an MMSC of about 24 to, to death in about four years, which for somebody in their 80s is a little unusual for Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease can be rapid in younger ages, but most of our 80, 90 year olds with Alzheimer's can go five to 10, even 15 years. So that was a kind of a remarkable case that went to autopsy and had very high levels of amyloid plaque and tangle. So had a very advanced Alzheimer's disease at the time of death. So it wasn't other factors that was causing that acceleration in him. Um, but, you know, these are anecdotal. I have a referral that I'll be seeing now that is starting to look like a pattern because this will be my fourth person who presents with more psychotic features, um, more delusions, delusions that um, kind of, uh, most of them are a little bit grotesque delusions. And we, we initially thought these might be individuals who have Lewy body dementia um, because you can get delusions in Lewy body dementia. We have one autopsy now an individual who presented with this kind of presentation, it was just straight out Alzheimer's disease. So there is, you know, at least anecdotally, I wonder if we're going to see some different presentations in individuals and whether we will see a more rapid progression. How, how do you, I mean, I throw it back to you, um, Paul, how do you answer that question? We, we need a large epidemiologic study. We're going to have to study many people over the age of 70. We're going to have to get a biomarker that tells us they have Alzheimer's disease. Mm-hmm. We're going to have to do some kind of confirmation. And I, I don't know who's going to, you know, fund that. I think it's critical. It probably needs to be a multi-center trial. Um, I've been talking to some of my colleagues about whether we should try to do that. It would be expensive because uh, differentiating for certain, the closest we can come is an amyloid PET scan and in vivo. So if you have an amyloid PET scan that's negative, you don't have Alzheimer's disease. But if it's positive, you may have Alzheimer's disease. There's a false positive rate of about 20%. So it's a tricky question to answer, Paul. We, I don't think we have the, the data. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, another uh, uh, member of the audience uh, asks about, I think you pretty well uh, talked about this, but, you know, person's in a busy office. You only have a few minutes um, to do anything with your patient. Um, why not use the HIV dementia scale um, or other quick tests? Well, the HIV dementia scale, uh, we, we've done a couple studies now that it just doesn't pick it up. You know, it was perhaps designed for dementia, but we don't see dementia in the setting of HIV. We see cognitive impairment. We see a milder level of impairment. It still picks up dementia, but I, dementia is probably 2% of the people referred to me. Maybe for me, maybe higher because I see I'm being referred. But for your population, it's just a small um, number of people. You're going to see people with inefficiency uh, that affects their ability to do functional uh, tasks, particularly multitasking and, and the HIV dementia scale just doesn't have the, the facility to pick that up. So that one is kind of a no, no. The MOCA in our hands takes eight minutes to do. 
um, we timed it because we knew that would be a common question. And people that have impairment, it can go out to 12. But people who are doing very well, it can get, come down to five. So that's an average. I think the digital tools, if we can get them, you can have them done in the waiting room. And then if you look at the slides that I had from uh, the American Family Physician, the mini cog is not hard to do. It's, you know, here's three words. Remember them. Draw this clock for me. And then, okay, what were those three words? And so that is something that might be able to fit in. And you would have at least something that you're doing in in that setting. So I've seen um, uh, publications that have given uh, broad populations um, uh, cognitive cognitive testing. And and one I recall, the population, this is an asymptomatic population, the test showed 50% of people were abnormal. It strikes me that there might be something wrong with a test in that in that case. Can you comment on the the most the most um, cited study uh, found a fifty percent rate of impairment in community dwelling individuals at five academic centers across the United States. If you look carefully at the paper, um, only about fifty percent of them had viral load suppressed. Uh, some of them were not even on therapy. So the rates I think will be higher for people not on therapy. Um, if you look at the studies where people are all suppressed, they fluctuate around quite a bit. And I think the rate is probably closer to 20 to 30 percent myself. And and that, that's what I can kind of gather from the studies that I have, have read. And I think some of the large epidemiologic studies, they're serving their purpose, which is what, what's the epidemiology. And then you can dig down a little bit deeper and find out what is it in this population, what is it in this population. Um, there are also a lot of factors that can be contributing in kind of a community-based population. Uh, for our studies, we, for example, will not allow people coming in if they're using drugs. That can certainly um, affect testing, even though we excluded just, you know, last month, somebody came in high on, on, um, on um, marijuana, you know, that lives his life apparently high all the time. Uh, well, that'll have an effect on your information processing speed. Uh, you know, at, at the, so they, there may be some things like that, uh, Paul. So um, a question um, about elaborating more on how you manage HIV-infected uh, people who uh, do exhibit some cognitive decline but no other obvious cause. What's your management approach? Well, a lot of reassurance, a lot of compensatory measures, making sure they stay on antitrophiles, they're taken correctly, not uh, like I take them on Monday through Friday, not on the weekends, which people do. Um, I, I try to make sure they're on a really good antiretroviral regimen. I have some people that have come in on two drugs and they've been doing very well for a long time. And I just have to wonder. Um, in those cases, I typically will do a CSF tap to make sure it's suppressed there. Um, I follow them mostly around symptoms. I don't do more cognitive testing on them. Uh, I'll be seeing somebody next Monday who I've been following now for 10 years and just likes to come in and get reassurance and um, and make sure he's treating all the other risk factors. Diabetes is under control. Hypertension is under control. They're, they're exercising. They're staying cognitively active. They're going out and doing things. All the things that you would you, your mother would tell you to do to stay healthy. Um, that's generally what I do. And if I'm worried, I, you know, because they come to me as a referral, I, I often do an LP just to make sure that we don't have escape. I, I wouldn't do it on somebody who's had five years of symptoms that have been there. Um, and not progressing, but somebody who's got one year of symptoms and seems to be progressing, I, I will often do that. So we have a couple questions um, from uh, our colleague in San Diego, Scott Latender, um, and um, who is also obviously a, an expert in this area. And one of the questions he asks is, how do you better integrate uh, AD experts into the HIV clinic? I think you might have some qu- thoughts about that, Victor. Boy, I, I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, Scott, <laughs> Scott and I uh, probably have talked about this many times. There, there are a handful of people uh, across the nation that do both. Bo Ansis, for example, David Clifford and, and, and myself that do both. In my clinic is half Alzheimer's or age-related dementias and half uh, HIV. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a challenge. Um, it's a challenge. I think the other piece for me that was really challenging with this talk is I'm not a primary care doctor. You know, I am referred to people who have, uh, who have challenges. So my approach is much different than the approach for all of you. Uh, so the, there's a number of different ways where we need to integrate more and, and, and try to solve this problem together. So uh, there's a question and I'd, I'd like you to kind of uh, 
talk around a little little bit, um, although we only have a few seconds left, so maybe I'll shut my mouth and just say, talk about CNS escape and what about ARV uh, uh, modifications in... Yeah, CNS escape is a very difficult topic. Scott Latonda could answer this so much better than I. Uh, when, when, it, when it first was presented, it was presented in a case report that it demonstrated to us that it's a rare occurrence, but it's not one that you want to miss. Um, and I tend to worry about people who have had uh, not been treated, uh, have had blips in their viral loads or have recent CNS infections such as syphilis or people with a more rapid course, people that have some neurologic findings at the same time. Certainly anyone with six months of symptoms that seem to be progressing, but maybe even a year these are people that I would do in a lumbar puncture to see if they have escape. If they do, then I treat it. If they, and many times, and I would say most of the time, they don't get better. So that becomes a CNS escape that was asymptomatic with regard to the types of symptoms they're having, but I don't want to miss it. There's, to me, there's no evidence to empirically change antiretrovirals in somebody in the absence of CNS escape. What you want to do is get somebody on a regimen that they tolerate, that their liver tolerates, that their kidney tolerates, that they're willing to take, that they're not having diarrhea, and they take it every single day and they stay suppressed. That's the critical thing. And, and I was taught this in a very tough way with an older patient who I insisted go on more intensive therapy. He has ended up being hospitalized with anemia with, uh, with massive aortic stenosis and nearly died. So I've become very practical about this, particularly people with cognitive impairment. We have so many regimens you can take once a day um, that work very well. And that's that's what I tend to recommend for people that are having uh, challenges. And and do not forget about ESCAPE. Uh, it's there, but it's relatively rare and, and it will require a different approach to therapy. Well, <laughs> Victor, that was a, really a great overview. And there are a lot of questions in the, in the Q&A. We will... Uh maybe run those by you and, and see if we could get to them later, but, uh, but I'll, really... I'll go in and answer them now. Okay, great. Really nice, nice job. Uh, I'll turn it over a couple minutes late now to, uh, to my friend, uh, Dr. Benson.